Today's headline is The Feathered Dandy. It says, Several August vacations spent in North Dakota gave me a close acquaintanceship with the dainty kill deer. He is a French dandy in feathers, with his dark ash gray broadcloth coat, white waistcoat and breeches, yellow hose, white collar, black choke tie, Johnny gray cap, and an ebony cane under each arm, carried so that it just shows along the edge of his elbow. He is a dandy of all birdom, to my notion. The spruce policeman blue jay cannot equal him, or the dapper mannequin cedar bird rival him. For killdeer, the dandy has not only the costume, but the air as well, which the rollicking blue jay and the dreamy cedar bird most certainly lack. See killdeer tripping on light feet, darting first from one bog or stone to another, as if disdaining the soil as immaculate garb with the oozy soil where he must feed. A penniless dandy walking down a muddy street to seek his breakfast in some cheap restaurant would carry himself in just that way. Back in the fields, his elegant is a trifle less noticeable, perhaps, but since the sort of tidbits he craves are found in the slime and mud, he must search for them there, in spite of his apparent dislike for anything unclean. He is an epicure, too, and enjoys a good meal as well as the next bird. During the warmest part of the day, after feeding all the morning, he likes to take a siesta while digesting his breakfast and awaiting his supper of worms and bugs that come out in the cool of the evening. He stands on one leg in a patch of dry gravel or on a sun-warmed stone, near enough to the water so that when he opens a sleepy eye, he can admire his own reflection in the mirror before him. At least that's his favorite attitude on sunny afternoons. Perhaps in those daydreams, he reflects on his own good looks and trusts to them for protection while he snoozes. I have admired the little killdeer at a distance every summer I've seen him. Still, his aloofness and his self-sufficiency rather kept me in awe of him, so to speak, and I never really felt that I knew him. Always seeing him with his society manner on, I wanted to know him more intimately by visiting him at home with his family. Last year, however, I made my North Dakota trip in May and saw quite a different killdeer from the one that I had always observed in August. Every time I went into the pasture, I found solitary killdeers flitting about everywhere, with other faults under their big caps and food. It was springtime, and killdeer must prance up and down for sheer love of living, and for his exuberant delight in knowing that the mate he has chosen was quietly brooding her eggs somewhere not far away. Whenever I approached a certain spot in the pasture, where it bordered a wheat field and ran down into a little boggy pond, I noticed that one of these little princes of dandies would suddenly appear from nowhere and fly round above me, calling out a shrill, incessant, kill dee, kill dee, 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 dee. There must be a nest around here, I decided, after a few days of this commotion, and commenced searching for it. Starting at the corner of the pasture, I went diagonally across it, from wheat field to pond and back again, and all the while, the anxious bird circled round above my head. I had made 18 or 20 of these closely parallel lines, when all at once, I flushed Kildeer's wife herself from the ground. She joined her mate and circled about me, shrieking as plaintively as he, and had my conscience not been free of any intent to harm them, their alarm and grief would have caused me to abandon the search. Feeling that my curiosity could do them no real harm, I kept on with my plan. Soon I had found the nest, or rather the nesting site, a mere hollow with a few sticks and pebbles roughly outlining a frame for the eggs. It was the eggs rather than the nest that attracted my attention. There were four of them, each as rich in color as springtime butter, and with their sharply pointed ends, autographed all over with scrolls and blotches as of faded black ink. As I stood looking at the eggs, the mother, or at least I chose to believe it was she, suddenly dropped down on the ground, almost at my feet. For a moment, I was deceived into thinking that she was really dying, but as soon as I stooped to pick her up, she deftly eluded my hand, with several wild flops that carried her a considerable distance away from the nest. Then I realized that I was being favored with a show of that deceit with which bird mothers often seek to protect their young, and to study this phase of killdeer tactics, I obligingly followed her. The poor, lame, broken-winged creature promised capture if I would only pursue her, but she slyly kept just out of my reach in spite of her lamentable condition. On and on she tumbled and tottered until I was some yards from the nest. Then with a twitter of victory, which I could not begrudge her, she spread her wings and flew quickly away toward the pond. As for Kildeer himself, he hovered above us all the way, crying his alarm and then his relief. I retraced my steps as well as I could, but long before I found the nest again, the parents were back circling above me and calling piteously. 
To relieve their distress, I went away, but every day thereafter, I made a short call on Mrs. Kildeer. She never grew accustomed to me, and would try to tow me away or scold me away. All the while, I lingered near the nest. I was anxious, however, to see a baby Kildeer newly hatched and did not let her anxiety prevent my daily visit. But to spare the mother any undue worry, I made a practice of standing afar off and studying the eggs through my opera glass. One forenoon, when I made my usual call, the hatching was on. The little ones were already drying themselves in the sun, and to my astonishment, were daintily pecking at their discarded shells, taking a cargo of grit aboard in preparation for the real feeding that they must soon have. The mother, too, who did not leave the vicinity of the nest for long, even to scold at me, helped the bantlings dispose of their empty shells by eating them herself. That evening, I heard killdeer cries from the wheat field when I passed by and found the old birds there in close attendance upon four little striped, downy fluffs and black-billed gray caps much too big for them and dark necklaces like their father's. But although the little fellows were almost lost in their great caps, which made them look as if they had been dressed in their father's cast-off headgear, and although that, with their stalk thin little legs, gave them a top-heavy appearance and friend to send them heels over head at every step, they were still able to run over the clods and dodge wheat stems at a good speed. I tried to catch one and found that the day-old baby was as quick as a flash and dodging my hand. They ran about like tiny chickens, peeping shrilly, and always with a question mark at the end of their P.E., as if anxious to learn all there was to know about the big world where they found themselves. I was thankful that the family did not leave the neighborhood, and I enjoyed visiting them for many days. Such independent little mites as those young killdeer were, asking nothing from their parents except companionship, and quite equal to finding their own food. Their efforts at learning to fly were a revelation. Ground dwellers though they were, and needing the power of flight as soon as any bird, they were fully ten days old before they could lift their bodies from the ground. From the first, they realized the importance of their wings and trusted implicitly in them. For in running, particularly to put distance between themselves and me, they would lift their tiny downy flappers and scud along head first over clods and tussocks. As the feathers began to come out, they would run more and more at tiptoe until before their wings were fully feathered, they could skim along just over the ground, not more than two inches in the air. It was not until they were almost three weeks old that they could really fly and could join their parents in those circling flights above my head. This story came from the great state of West Virginia, being reported in the Shepherdstown Register of June 7, 1917. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.